Well, Professor Rebecca DeSchweinitz is Associate Professor of History at Brigham Young University. Uh, she graduated with a BA in History from BYU. After coordinating the work of student interns at the Utah State Capitol, teaching English in Japan, and working in special collections at the Cloud Moore Health Science Library at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, she completed her MA and PhD in History at the University of Virginia. She's the recipient in 2019 of the Wells and Myrtle Cloward Teaching and Learning Faculty Fellowship. Her research focuses on race, youth, and politics in American history. We are very pleased to welcome Professor DeSchweinitz. Her topic today, From Protest to Politics, Vote 18 and the Crisis of American Democracy. Please give Professor DeSchweinitz a warm Zoom welcome. <laughs> Okay, uh, as part of this talk, I was asked to start with something of an overview of the history of voting rights and challenges to voting rights. And so I'll do that and then I'll talk about some of my current research on the movement to lower the voting age to 18. Uh, and as luck would have it, I've ended up with a cold, so I, I hope that my voice um, stays strong and I guess I'm just grateful that it's not something worse. Uh, my Thoughts and prayers are with those who uh, are and have been suffering from the effects of COVID-19, as well as with those who are working on the front lines. I think that we're all aware that the founders had a rather limited view of who we the people actually were, the people who had the requisite independence and stake in society to exercise voting rights, to serve on juries, and to be elected to public office. Voting rights were originally largely restricted to propertied white men. Those restrictions did not go uncontested, so I want you to think about how at every point in American history, folks have challenged the limits of American democracy and have connected ideals about natural rights to their own status in the nation. Lower and middling sorts of militiamen in Philadelphia, for, for instance, successfully pressed for early voting rights as did farmers in Vermont and various groups of others across the first states. There was also always pushback, conservative forces trying to maintain the status quo, whether it was centered on class, national origin, gender, racial, or age biases. The franchise broadened dramatically over the course of the 19th century. Property qualifications were the first to go. By, 19, by 1850, only two states maintained property requirements, and perhaps unsurprisingly, they applied only to specific groups, foreign-born residents in Rhode Island and African-Americans in New York. This upsurge of democracy was not inevitable, nor was it uncontested. Repeatedly, ineligible citizens organized and petitioned and pressured states to expand the right to vote. The already privileged resisted. Partisan competition, economic development, and ideological changes grounded in concrete shifting social conditions brought reform. But this doesn't mean that economic barriers to voting disappeared. States often maintained tax qualifications well into the 20th century, and this is beyond the infamous poll taxes, which last until the mid-1960s. And not until the 1930s did some states get rid of pauper provisions, which could be used to disqualify folks who received some sort of social welfare assistance. Moreover, in the first half of the 19th century, as more and more white men won the right to vote, African American voting rights constricted. Northern states increasingly began limiting the franchise to white men. Southern states like North Carolina, added the word white into their constitutional requirements just to be sure that free blacks would be excluded. And in 1857, the US Supreme Court ruled that black people, whether enslaved or not, could not be citizens. So I want you to think about how at no point in American history can we tell a simple progressive story about voting rights. After the Civil War, thanks to the efforts of black abolitionists and their white allies, black men who served in the Union Army, and radical Republican politicians. So again, in the words of Frederick Douglass, there is no freedom without struggle. Black male voting rights were guaranteed, or at least supposedly guaranteed, by the 14th and 15th Amendments. So the Civil War then ushers in this remarkable era that is sometimes talked about as America's second founding where we begin to really imagine for the first time and to, and to work toward a more just multiracial society. 
And I want to highlight that this is possible largely because the federal government begins to play an active role in protecting freedom. So we have the emergence of this idea of positive liberty, where government, uh, its role is to help secure liberty rather than being seen as just something that threatens our freedom. Congress passes these amendments. Uh, they also pass enforcement legislation. They pass other civil rights bills. And there's this short period of time, this, uh, this window of opportunity um, where things might have gone differently before it gets shut down by the forces of white supremacy. And how this gets shut down matters to history. And it also indicates what are going to become some ongoing patterns, strategies for disfranchisement moving into the future strategies that are manifest in myriad ways even today. Uh, one of those is violence and intimidation. The election of 1868 is the most racist, violent election in American history. The KKK has its first reel coming out during this election. There's a reign of terror across the South as black men risk their lives going to the polls. And just to give you a sense of um, that, uh, I'll tell you that there were more than 200 political murders in Arkansas. The death toll in Georgia is lower, but only because intimidation was so effective. So out of something like 9,300 Republican um, voters on the voting rolls, and remember that at the time Republicans are the party of black freedom and the party of positive liberty, uh, Grant, their presidential candidate, tallies only 87 votes. Louisiana employs the worst of both strategies between April and November of that year. More than 1,000 people, almost all of them black, die in political violence. And only 501 Republican voters out of 2,800 cast ballots. Violent, sometimes lethal voter suppression and white supremacist poll watching became less necessary as states passed laws that took up the work of disc discrimination. The 1896 election was the first sense emancipation not marked by political murder. And it's no coincidence that this is the year that segregation was upheld by the Supreme Court. So we have a shift from extra legal measures to legal measures of disfranchisement. Uh, violence at the polls, however, reemerged after World War I and in the post-World War II era as returning black servicemen tried to exercise the right to vote. Uh, and then especially in the 1950s and 60s as the movement for black freedom increasingly challenged the structures of white supremacy in American life. Fraud, actual fraud, things like stuffing ballot boxes, stealing ballots, uh, destroying ballots, uh, counting ballots for the other side, but also accusations of fraud were used to dis dis disenfranchise black and other opposition party voters in the late 19th century. Uh, accusations of fraud during this time also justified and led to the creation and formalization of restrictive registration practices. And I think we need to pay attention to how then, as now, registration procedures were designed not just to protect the vote, but to make it more difficult for particular groups of people to vote. Uh, and there were heated partisan ballots over this then as there are now, with one party generally trying to restrict the ability of people to register, to limit participation in elections, and the other trying to democratize voting to make it easier for a whole range of folks to vote. Uh, and just to give you a sense of some of the new requirements that they're, that they're enacting, um, they're, they're enacting lengthy residency requirements, they're also limiting the hours where, it's, uh, where registration is open, um, and this is specifically to make it difficult for working men to be able to register. Uh, they're sometimes imposing stricter requirements on urban residents. So the city of Philadelphia, for instance, is the target of some of the harshest registration restrictions. Uh, sometimes uh, officials would do things like start requiring quasi-court-like procedures to verify your eligibility. Um, they also might engage in precinct verification, so the police would show up at your uh, house to check your address and make sure that everything was in the up and up. Uh, states also started uh, requiring yearly re-registration. Registration might only be available a few days a year. 
Uh, so this, this information might be hard to access as well, and registration might be taking place in out-of-the-way locations that you're not going to know about unless somebody wants you to know about it. Now, it's noteworthy, I think, that once women get the right to vote, that this changes, that they, women voters change some of this, and they start um, making good on their word that they're going to clean up politics, and they open up access in some significant ways to voting rights. Poll taxes, um, which, which many states, in many states are cumulative, so it's not just that you have to pay the poll tax if you want to vote that year, but you have to pay all of your back taxes. Um, restricted by creating all sorts of economic barriers. And we know how successful poll taxes were at the work of disenfranchisement because, again, of what happens with women's suffrage. suffrage. After the 19th Amendment passes, some southern states decide to temporarily um, lift their poll tax requirements. And in the wake of that, the number of people going to the polls surges beyond just these new women voters. And then when those poll taxes get reinstituted, um, uh, the voting numbers um, go down again. Literacy and understanding tests applied and judged according to the whims of local registrars um, are another uh, mechanism. Most famously, these are used in the South to disenfranchise black voters, but many northern and western states also had proof of education requirements or intelligent testing into the 1940s. Uh, states also might impose restrictive primaries or par political parties would impose these restrictive par um, primaries so only whites can vote in the southern democratic um, uh, primaries, um, and since the South is solidly Democratic, this is the only election that really matters. Um, and uh, we, we might see some kind of current uh, ways that restrictive uh, primaries are also in place today. Uh, disfranchising particular groups of people was another way, like ex-felons, uh, and these measures were clearly linked to racialized discourses of crime and were and continue to be specifically designed to disenfranchise black people. Uh, and if you're not aware, in the wake of emancipation, southern, southern states made a whole slew of crimes that were associated with black people, things like stealing a pig or a fence rail. Um, these become felony offenses which is part of how this racialized discourse about crime gets created and reinforced. Uh, at the same time, um, many more obvious, obviously serious crimes that are associated with white people are categorized as lesser crimes and don't carry this kind of um, into the future disfranchisement mechanism. When and where legal disfranchisement wasn't possible, gerrymandering or redrawing voting districts in convoluted ways to diffuse voting power, we know about this, or packing districts uh, so that an opposition party's electoral strength is contained within one area became other commonly used strategies for weakening the efficacy of voting rights. Women, largely white women that is, win the right to vote in 1920 and they immediately get to work to break down some of these barriers to voting. Uh, and to turn their votes to use. So we see women um, kind of pushing their political priorities and getting appropriations, uh, especially on the state level for the things that they care most about. But there remained significant challenges to America's democratic ideals. Native Americans still were not considered legal American citizens until Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act uh, in 1924. Even then, some states, including Utah, continued to bar Native Americans from voting as late as 1957. African Americans in the Jim Crow South continued to be disenfranchised. And just so that you can appreciate the scope of this disfranchisement, as late as 1960, fewer than 2% of Mississippi's black adults were registered to vote. And this is a state where 42% of the population was black. Uh, and they're kept from voting by all of the same mechanisms that had disenfranchised their, um, their ancestors in the late 19th century, including violence. Now, this changed and democracy opened up, not because racial equality was an idea whose time had come, but because African Americans and their white allies fought for a broad range of citizenship rights. Uh, 
Their campaigns led directly to passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which finally outlawed the discriminatory voting practices southern states had enacted in the wake of Reconstruction and put in place measures to restrain states with a history of discrimination from passing new statutes designed to restrict suffrage. But then, despite their ongoing efficacy, key elements of the Voting Rights Act were invalidated by the Supreme Court in 2013, and many American citizens continue to struggle against concerted efforts to disenfranchise them. In this year's election, you might be noticing that there are especially alarming efforts to limit voter participation using a fair number of the strategies I've mentioned. Students who won the right to vote only 50 years ago are among those who face restrictive requirements that are consciously designed to subvert their voting rights. Uh, and just to give you a couple of examples, a few years ago, Maine Secretary of State sent out threatening letters to students and no one else, just students, telling them that they risked losing financial aid, health care, their driver's license, and car registration if they tried to vote in their college towns. Texas recently purged student voters who listed an out-of-town mailing address without telling them, while Virginia purged students from voting rolls who listed campus addresses last year. Tennessee allows faculty to use their university IDs uh, as proof of um, voter registration and voting, um, but not students. New Hampshire changed its definition of domicile and started requiring students to change their driver's license and car registration within 60 days in order to vote um, where they go to school. Uh, a number of states ended early voting on college campuses. One example of this is Florida, which made rules about early voting spots, having to have a minimum number of parking spaces, and this is, was specifically designed to disenfranchise student voters. So that's a kind of sense of some uh, current examples. Uh, these measures that disenfranchise students are generally framed in terms of fighting fraud. Now, with some of the difficulties that today's students face in mind, I'll turn to talk about some of my current research on the history of the movement to lower the voting age to 18 and connect it to some different ways to think about the Kennedy Center's theme this semester. If you don't know, 18-year-olds won the right to vote through the Voting Rights Extension Act of 1970 and after the Supreme Court rejected the scope of some of its provisions through the 26th Amendment, which Congress passed and states ratified in short order the following year. In popular memory, the story goes something like this. In the context of America's involvement in an increasingly unpopular war, it became untenable to force young men to fight and die in Vietnam when many of them did not enjoy the right to vote. Moreover, political elites, fearful of the proliferation of youth protests, felt compelled to channel youthful political dissent into appropriate and manageable forms. But you might imagine that this doesn't capture the multi-layered struggle involved or the broader ideas on which the youth franchise movement was based. Proposals to lower the voting age appeared regularly before national and state legislatures after Congress amended the Selective Service Act in 1942 and began drafting young men for military at age 18. That the government deemed 18-year-olds old enough to fight made some believe that it should also recognize them as old enough to vote. But not everyone agreed that a lower draft age necessitated a lower voting age. Emanuel Seller, a Democrat from New York, Vote 18's most ardent antagonist from the 1940s through the 70s, and he's also the longtime chair of the powerful House Judiciary Committee, explained the main argument. Voting is as different from fighting as chalk is from cheese. Military leaders could judge 18-year-olds sufficiently psychologically and physically developed to follow directions and wield a gun in battle, but youth lacked the good judgment essential to good citizenship. In lowering the voting age for compulsory military service, though, Congress highlighted the tenuous boundary between youth and adulthood and assured that the chronological age of 21 could no longer be taken for granted as a sacrosanct marker of adult status. People on both sides of the debate admitted that the ages between 18 and 21 represented an ambiguous stage in human growth. The indistinctness of age as a developmental sign meant that ultimately the decision as to voting age must be somewhat arbitrary. There has to be a line drawn at some age and no figure is magical, allies and opponents acknowledged. 
Both groups also agreed that voting required a degree of common sense and social responsibility. The trouble remained. No one really knows when adolescence reaches the age of common sense. With no magic number, Vote 18 allies argued that the new draft age provided a concrete alternative age and one at which young people assumed other adult duties and rights. Indeed, although Vote 18 advocates called on fight vote arguments as they made the case for the, a lower voting age, they favored broader lines of reasoning about youth responsibility and legal status, arguing that those most affected by policy should have a say in that policy or good enough to contribute good enough to vote. Late 60s and early 70s advocates painted a collective portrait of potential youth voters as responsible citizens who undertook multiple duties associated with adulthood. Demographics also mattered. While in the early 40s, people tended to marry after the age of 21, in the late 60s, the average age of marriage in some states was 19 for men and 18 for women. Uh, and so this kind of post-war cult of domesticity, domesticity and the baby boom influenced um, in some ways how we're thinking about America's youth. Other figures are showing that some 60% of youth in, the, in this age category work full time. Then there were changes in education. Graduating from high school had been out of reach for many earlier generations of citizens, but graduation rates tripled between 1920 and 1940. Uh, and so when Congress first begins debating the voting age, finishing high school had just become the norm for Americans. So it's just over 50% there. Uh, in 1970, with nearly 80% of American youth graduating from high school and close to 50% of this age group enrolled in colleges, Vote 18 allies insisted that reason does not permit us to ignore any longer the reality that 18-year-old young Americans are prepared by education, by experience, by exposure to public affairs to assume and exercise the privilege of voting. More than any other argument, Vote 18 supporters in the late 60s and early 70s turned to the relatively high proportion of highly educated and politically sophisticated youth as they tried to justify lowering the voting age. Advocates across the political spectrum favored, favorably compared well-educated American youth with already enfranchised adults. Improved education marked a crucial difference, they said, between this youthful generation and previous ones. Today's 18-year-olds shouldn't be given the right to vote, should be given the right to vote, not because they are old enough, but because they are smart enough to vote. Uh, and it might be of interest to know that one of the main drivers behind a coalition organi organization um, for Vote 18 was the National Education Association. 1940s and 60s Vote 18 allies rightly claimed the current generation of young Americans as the best educated group of 18 to 20 year old, 21 year olds in the nation's history. But for advocates in the later period, the high school graduation had become the most widely shared transition point between youth and adulthood. Uh, advocates in both periods believed in the notion of education through participation, so this idea of you learn as you do, and expressed concern about the vote slackers created by the lag time between the time a student may graduate from high school and the first time they have the opportunity to vote. But rather than hypothesize about the political potential of 18-year-olds or suggest the vote would spur those who had studied American democracy in the classroom toward active citizenship in the world, late 60s supporters argued that youth participation in a range of community conscious projects, political campaigns, and protests demonstrated the concern, energy, and ability of young people to deal with political issues. Young people were already thoroughly informed and engaged political actors. For some, this age co cohort seemed more politically savvy than anybody else in the country. The combination of young people's increasing education levels and obvious political engagement led youth franchise supporters to joke that maximum rather than minimum age restrictions should be imposed. When it first started being debated, Vote 18 advocates had described potential 18-year-old voters as red-blooded, high-minded, innovative, and energetic. The, the young voter will bring in a large measure of idealism and impulse. But for many, that was the central problem with the idea of lower the voting age. Vote 18 opponents in the 40s and 50s successfully associated political idealism with a lack of real-world world experience and judicious thought. 
Overly idealistic, impressionable, and prone to hasty action and radical solutions, foes warned that if given the vote, young people would be easily misled by propaganda and political tricksters. Older citizenship models treated idealism with suspicion. Voters needed the experience, wisdom, and stability that accrued with age. That this age group did not manifest strong party affiliations, identify with particular professions, or support special interests contributed to a sense of them as inconsistent and hence unworthy of the franchise. Although the pace of change had escalated, most people in the 40s believed that the future would resemble the present and that society's elders could effectively prepare the young for what lay ahead. Within a few decades, that thinking shifted. The emergence of a world community and the speed of technological, economic, and social change ushered in what scholars like Margaret Mead described as a new phase of cultural evolution in which nowhere in the world are there elders who know what their children know. A growing belief that significant change was inevitable, happening quickly, and to be desired meant that young people's susceptibility to change increasingly made 18-year-olds seem like logical rather than risky participants in the democratic process. Successful youth activism for civil rights and young people's ongoing selfless, generous, compassionate, and self-sacrificing challenges to the status quo convinced many that the idealism considered endemic among 18 to 21 year olds uniquely qualified them for greater participation in politics. Enfranchising 18 year olds would allow idealistic, politically and democratically minded youth to even more effectively help to close the real gap in America, which lay not between the generations, between old and young, but between the nation's ideals and actions. As Vote 18 allies explained, active involvement in the political process can constructively focus youth idealism on the most effective means of change in a free society. So once a sign of their immaturity, the ethical, idealistic spirit of young people represented a new norm for responsible citizenship. So characteristics closely, closely associated with 18-year-olds were to be encouraged rather than criticized in the age of Aquarius. As Vote 18 allies of the period argued, under modern conditions, we need the tonic leaven of young adults in our decision making. To many, infusing youth who are described as adept structural def defect specialists into the electoral system encrusted in worn out traditions seem less of a dangerous experiment than a recipe for the regeneration of the democracy. As Representative Abner Mikva, a Democrat from Illinois, explained, a lower voting age would act as a fountain of youth to some of our old, tired institutions. And on the other side of the political aisle, Representative Dan Kubiak, a, rep a Republican from Texas, insisted that young people, idealistic, unreserved, unfettered, would bring new blood, new ideas, and clearer vision to American government. So the idea that there is something fundamentally wrong with American politics, that the vital citizen engagement that lay at the heart of America's democratic experiment um, had given way to compliance and convenience permeated the era's commentary on Vote 18. So, and adding voices of restive, concerned, earnest, and informed 18 to 20 year, 21 year olds would provide significant revitalization of American politics and government. The youth vote then represented the next great step in the march of democracy, not just because it was just and right to give millions of young but conscientious citizens the most basic right of all, but because the nation needs it. American politics needed reviving, of course, partly because young people had contributed to what was widely hailed as a national crisis of confidence in our institutions. It was hardly accidental that a concerted and successful campaign to lower the voting age emerged in 1968. So this is the same year as Tet, where it becomes clear with the escalation of the Vietnam War that government officials are not being completely honest. We have the Kerner Commission report, which is documenting structural racism in America, contentious Republican and Democratic national conventions, and a host of militant youth protests that are related um, to these events, not to mention um, some high-profile political assassinations. Uh, observers describe 1968 as a watershed wherein myths about the free society and liberalism came crumbling down. 
So youth activism might have played a role in that crumbling, but lower voting age advocates insisted that youth activism and the qualities it signal was also the solution to the political crisis of the period. As Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, a Democrat from Montana, explained the country could stand a little educating from its youngsters. Um, so proponents of a lower voting age um, saw young people as dedicated to solving the problems of the real world and unwilling to sit on the sidelines while the events that are affecting their destiny are being played out in the field. Vote 18 allies insisted that the country had a choice, continue our useless war against youth and lose those special values, or allow 18 to 21 year olds to add some healthy dose of heart and public honesty to our style. So, um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of the history and context in which youth won the right to vote. Uh, and part of this is the idea that America and American democracy is in crisis and that young people are going to help to address this challenge. But just as there was no magic age to determine civic competency, there was also no magic way to translate voting rights into people actually voting. One of the challenges of democracy has been how we make it more democratic to get rid of unfair exclusions, how we get different groups of people the basic rights of citizenship, like the right to vote. Another challenge of democracy has been, and we've already talked a little bit about this, how do we get people to be able to exercise the rights of citizenship once they ostensibly have those rights? And as part of my research, and we can pull up um, this first image, I've also been looking at the massive voter registration campaigns directed at youth in the wake of the 26th Amendment. A range of national and local groups, groups long involved in voter registration, like the Legal Women Voters, the NAACP, and union organi organizing, organizations, as well as newer ones like the National Movement for the Student Vote, the Youth Citizenship Fund, Frontlash, and Concerned Young Voters, developed a range of projects to register young voters. They recognize that young people now have the lowest participation rates in the nation and that major efforts will be required to give real meaning to the new legislation. And so they did things like set up registration tables on street corners, parking lots, and shopping centers. They got principals to arrange for registration booths at schools. They sent mobile voter vans around cities aiming to register youth on the spot. They organized registration rallies at beaches, state parks, and fairgrounds, complete with motivational speakers and rock bands in some cases. Some groups encouraged youth to register by sponsoring dances, presenting your voter registration card got you a discounted admission rate. Others screened specially made films in school assemblies. As students exited the, the gym, they passed by registration stations. Uh, and they also made a lot of efforts to get youth involved in this registration effort themselves to appeal to their peers. Um, they coordinated with basketball stars on voter registration radio spots with DJs, the record industry, and musicians. A limited run, live Jimi Hendrix Otis Redding album went out to some lucky youth voter registration volunteers. A&M released a double album featuring artists like Cat Stevens and the Carpenters, which they offered free to anyone with a voter registration receipt. Other artists included registration materials in their record merchandising or made plugs at concerts. If state law allowed, registrars were on hand to, speed, to sign up concert goers. John Lennon got banned from the US because the Nixon administration got wind that he was working with youth voter registration organizations. Uh, television executives started new late night programming, a show called Midnight Special that featured performances by a range of contemporary artists interspersed with bits about voter registration. These youth-centered voter registration groups identified significant and recurrent obstacles to youth voting. They set up information clearing houses to keep track of and help advertise often shifting state laws and deadlines. They published reports of legal obstacles young people faced and got involved in litigation that would allow college students to vote in their college towns and that were directed at modifying lengthy resident, residential requirements, among other things. They developed reforms and submitted proposals to House and Senate subcommittees and both national parties. Their work targeted students, but also non-students and military personnel. In the aftermath of the 1972 election, they continued to work toward liberalizing voter registration laws and promoted things like automatic and postcard voter registration. Um, and you can do the next slide. Uh, here's an image um, that 
t that kind of shows how you know part of what they're trying to do is to make young people aware that the ballot box is the most potent way t that exists to change the conditions that get them down. Um, uh, and you can go to the other one too. So. Now, groups working on voter registration, those who actually took it seriously, recognized that appeals to youth, like for other voters, were most successful when tied to the issues they cared about. Um, and across the political spectrum, these are the issues that young people at the time um, cared about. And this also um, was true across all sorts of other variables. So regardless of race, political party, class, gender, region, the primary issues are all the same. Um, and they are the environment, economic issues, especially related to urban problems, and race. So um, young people's political priorities centered on these fundamental issues, which might sound strikingly familiar uh, today. Um, all right, um, I'll skip over some examples so that we can be sure to have some time for discussion. Um, uh, and I'll just say political parties um, did also engage in voter registration projects, including some directed toward youth, but most youth voter registra registration organizations were nonpartisan, and so they don't uh, get involved in get out the vote campaigns, um, and they don't discriminate in registering potential voters. Uh, if you think about the issues young people said represented their political priorities, it's perhaps not surprising that youth voter registration efforts were more enthusiastically taken up by Democrats. Republicans, as one reporter explained, generally boycotted the registration drives. Some even denounced them, often raising fears about voter fraud. Republican youth organizations conducted some of their own youth voter registration campaigns, but made a point, and this comes from um, archival sources to canvas heavily Republican neighborhoods and to register only youth who specifically identified as Republican. So I make the observation that then as now, liberals believe that registering as many youth as possible was in their interests. As one front lash pamphlet put it, we persist um, in the belief that the problems of democracy can be solved by more democracy. While Republicans in both periods appear to see youth voter suppression um, the silencing and containing of the youth vote as an operative election strategy. In the early 70s, young people like now tended to identify as politically independent, were, but were considerably more liberal and more democratic than the country at large. Um, youth voters ended up not making a difference or turning out in very impressive numbers in the 1972 presidential election. And not until 2008 did youth voters have a notable impact on that level of contest where their voting made the difference for President Obama in both North Carolina and Indiana. Now this doesn't mean that youth, youth didn't affect other races and policies on, on a range of levels, local, state, national, or on kind of the, some of the things that campaigns are, are talking about and kind of the style of campaigning. Uh, indeed, in the first year that 18-year-olds could vote, Joe Biden won his seat in the Senate against an incumbent, in part because of young voters. And closer to home, Orrin Hatch did the same in 1976 after mobilizing students across the state. Moreover, as Nixon and his campaign well understood, youth is not a monolith. Working class youth tend to be less liberal than their college students. Um, counterparts, uh, young white males historically have the highest voting rates of any youth voters and young voters often run into particular difficulties when, with voter registration and with actually voting. So they might intend to vote, but end up not. Still, observers in the last few years have noted young people's increasing participation in political protests. March for Our Lives was one of the biggest youth-led protests since the Vietnam era. Youth activism on global climate issues has drawn in millions of demonstrators and young people have been on the front lines of protests for racial justice over this past summer and fall. One contemporary youth vote organizer explained, we're seeing millions of people who just turned 18 that are extremely plugged into the issues. But they wonder, if youth engagement in the streets is evident, will it translate to the ballot box? Will youth shift from protests to politics? An open letter to newly enfranchised young people in 1972 declared that a new era in American politics had dawned. Young people have been granted the most powerful political instrument in our country, the vote. These newly enfranchised young people can have a significant impact on the outcome of the upcoming elections. 
The 18-year-old vote can mean youth power, but only if you take the time to register and vote. I hope that you will use your power in this year's election. Thank you. Lots of clapping hands, there we go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We have just a few minutes remaining, but uh, let's, let's open that up to questions. If you'd like to type your question in, uh, in the box and turn on your uh, camera so uh, Professor DeSchweins can see you. Um, the first question we've got here is a thank you so much from Laura. Uh, where can we find some so more sources to read up on topics more? It's very interesting. <laughs> Um, well, I'm working on a book on this topic uh, that's not out yet, but I have published uh, an article. I'm happy to share that, um, and you can um, kind of make that available. Um, there's also some really great work that's being done. Um, there's a Harvard Youth Poll that um, does a lot to collect um, contemporary, um, you know, thinking of youth on political issues, and uh, and that pulls in, you know, information about some of the kind of reg registration difficulties students are facing as well as kind of what they're, um, you know, how they're thinking about particular issues. Uh, I think it's no accident that Joe Biden actually recently hired the head of this Harvard Youth Poll. Um, he's intent on, you know, trying to mobilize young voters and, and letting them know that um, he's thinking and cares about the issues that, that they've identified as their priorities. Very interesting. Um, what, I'm curious, just in your role as a, as a professor of history, some, some people have talked about the importance of improving civics education, although there's been a big, big debate about whether that, that really would make an impact. I'm interested in, in your perspective on that. Uh, yeah, so, um, so this has been kind of the perennial question um, is, you know, how do we get, especially, you know, once young people get the right to vote, how do we get them to actually register and then vote? Um, and, you know, there are currently lots of debates about should we even lower the voting age lower <laughs> and maybe this will get rid of the gap. Um, my sense is that we need to be spending our efforts more in um, trying to get young people who are already enfr enfranchised, you know, on the path towards civic engagement. Uh, I think there are particular types of civics education that um, that lend themselves better to being able to uh, mobilize and inspire young people to uh, to take up uh, this civic responsibility. Um, one of the things that that youth voter registration folks recognized in the late '60s, early '70s, however, was that um, kind of telling young people this was their civic duty didn't really make a difference. It was when they talked to youth about particular issues that they cared about, that's when they saw success. And so I think civics education um, can perhaps be better reoriented less to this kind of duties and responsibilities notion and more to talking and thinking through particular issues and how they affect you and and the different levels of how you can get involved you know maybe even before you have the right to vote uh, thank you uh, professor hadfield has a comment about registering to vote uh did, did you want to say something professor hadfield okay um any final questions oh uh, a question from jillian um, is Frontlash still an active organization? I've never heard of them until now. Could, could registration drive still mobilize voters? There are, uh, Frontlash is not currently around, um, but there are lots of voter registration, mobilization organizations, including a number that are associated particularly with youth. And I know that Dr. Hadfield has been involved with one of these organizations. Um, so maybe you do want to say something <laughs> about this. Yeah, somebody, I think it was Anessa, is putting up Rock the Vote, um, which is there. And they also work with When We All Vote. 
Um, I can't remember the Utah-based one, and I'm not sure if they're t they are still active. Um, last I checked, they were. Do you have them on the screen there, Rebecca? Uh, I see I you looking see at the screen, but I don't know if you. I can't see the screen. Okay. But yeah, um, so yeah, there's, uh, it's pretty easy in Utah to register online. Just go to vote.utah.gov. You have to do that by 5 p.m. on October 23rd. I would say do it right away. You don't have that much time. And I think ballots are being mailed out as, as soon as yesterday. Great. All right, we do have a couple more questions. So Elizabeth, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Thank you. Yeah, so I spent some time living in Brazil, and there I, I noticed the voting age is 16, which is was very different to me, and voting is mandatory for every Brazilian citizen. So what are, is that, do you think that is effective, or what are your opinions on it being mandatory? Uh, yeah, so I think a system where you opt out rather than opt in, in terms of voter registration, is a, is a good thing. Um, you know, anything that makes it easier uh, to register, I think the movement toward uh, mail voting, mail-in voting uh, is also something that has the potential to democratize voting and um, up voter participation rates across all age spectrums. All right, and thank you. And then our final question from Juan, would you like to ask your question about uh, voting for uh, ex-convicted felons? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, you briefly mentioned ex-convicts and how their voting rights are hindered. Uh, how do you think that this can be fixed in like the coming years, perhaps? So, uh, you know, this is something that can be taken up by either state or federal legislation. Um, you know, there are challenges to, you know, either way of addressing it, but I, but I think it's an important question, you know, do we want to permanently disenfranchise, you know, any particular class of American citizens? Um, you know, if folks are, you know, rehabilitated and entering, um, you know, American life and society, don't they have a right to have a say in, um, in the laws and, and what's happening and the policies that are affecting their lives. So uh, I think it's something that I, that I hope gets addressed, uh, as well as a whole range of other, uh, you know, restrictive um, uh, kind of measures that, uh, that have worked to disenfranchise large groups of people. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for your questions. And please join me in thanking Professor DeSchweinitz.